So as we start up on 7.4, when you're talking about something being an inverse, where it says these five concepts you must know, hint, hint, when the next quiz comes, I will be asking you to rattle off at least three of them. So you want to kind of get these ingrained a little bit into your head, but you're going to because we're going to be using them a lot. First, to find an inverse, you switch the x and the y. For instance, when we get down below to some of the examples, like 2, 3, 4, and 5, I'm literally going to switch those, but switch the x and y. Okay. Then we're going to solve for y, and that's going to tell me what the picture of that particular graph inverse looks like. We're actually going to look at some of those, too, so you can see how this works. The domain and range switch, which basically is the same thing that happens when you're switching x and y. Those kind of go together. To graph the inverse, you're reflecting the original graph of the line y equals x. I'll make that a lot simpler once we get there, because you'll start seeing your points are just going to flip for every one of the points you have in your graph. Not a bad thing. The inverse is a function if the original passes the horizontal line test. We'll be doing that down here at the bottom of the front of our sheet. And then the compositions, yes, we're not getting rid of the f of g of and g of f of stuff. They'll equal each other if you have an inverse of something. And you'll get to see that. That's kind of a cool thing. So if you understand those things, we're going to get practice at all of them. Basically, you know how to find the inverse of a function. So we'll start simple. It doesn't get real tough, but we'll get real simple here to start. If you're given a chart, okay, to get the inverse of that chart, you just switch the x and the y. And I literally mean you just switch. No. No. This, this could be any chart in general. Yeah, there's not a specific graph that we're looking at here. So anytime you're asked to find an inverse and there's a chart involved, you're just basically flipping the chart over. And you're done. If I went to graph these, they would be a reflection of each other over this y equals x line that it mentioned up above. So it's kind of cool how all these things end up blending together. It kind of makes them smoother, but you'll get to see that here in a little bit. If it's in an equation form, my first job is to switch the x and the y around, but then I need, again, like I mentioned up above, to solve for y. I'm not just done at this point. So if I wanted to get y by itself, what would I need to do next? We're going to add 4. Last step. Divide by 2. Now you can choose when you get to this point, just put the divide by 2, and you're like, what are you putting this little negative 1 on the y for? It's just another way of labeling that it's the inverse. It's not wrong if you don't put it, but it just helps remind you, oh, this is the inverse of the other one. Or if you wanted to write it out as individual fractional parts, that's fine. I'm good with either of these. I always want to simplify as much as I can, and these are actually both in their simplified form. But always when looking for an inverse, switch x and y, and then start working it from there. Same thing here. Switch x and y. And start working on solving for y. Hmm, what do I have to do first this time? Ah, track six. Good job. Because that's going to make it a whole lot easier than dealing with the fraction first here. And we'll see how fancy some of you get. Now what? Okay. I can multiply by the reciprocal. That's an option. Because, again, if I do that, I'll just have to distribute that through. Now, some of you going to the reciprocal are going to be like, hmm. Okay. So reciprocal people, you do reciprocal right now. I'm going to take one extra step in here. So I already why always take an extra step in everything. Because I know some of you well enough. 
You know, if you try to go that fast, you're going to do something interesting. So I'm going to go ahead and just get the 3 out of there first, and then divide by the negative 2. And those of you that did the reciprocal, you're doing the same thing. And again, whether you do it to each term or you keep it in a fractional form, I don't care. That won't reduce any further, but negative 18 over negative 2 will. So if you multiply by your reciprocal, you should be getting the same thing. Nope, not a bit. If you add negative 3 halves x plus 9 equals y and negative 3, all good. As long as we get that same function, we're ready to go. Just back up a little bit. So then for 4, same deal. Just kind of taking on different types of things. Step number one. Subtract the eight. That's where it starts to get interesting. Divide by two. Now, when you get here, again, like we've said on the first two, I can leave it in a fractional form, or I could break it up if I wanted to. Here's what I want you to be careful of. What's my last step here? The square rooting. Well, now there's a couple of things that we're going to get into that I'm going to say that you're going to be like, oh, hard, that's not right. Yes, this can be written, and I'll show both ways on it. You do have to remember the plus minus part. Because anytime we have a squared that we're solving for, there's going to be you know, additional things working. But that's just stating that it's an inverse. Yeah, if you don't put it, it's not wrong. You can either write it this way, and like Chris had mentioned, well, do we have to rationalize the denominator then? No, not for this. Um, because it's going to end up taking more work than we actually have to deal with. But also answering the other question, could I write it as 1 half x minus 4 and have my square root on there? Yeah. Here's the one thing that scares me with some of you on that. I have a feeling somebody would look at this and say, ooh, 4 is a perfect square. I'll just make this 2. No. These are combined. This is all locked up by that minus. So unless I can break down everything inside, I can't do any more than that. So just something to kind of keep an eye out for. But I like some of the questions and some of the ideas so far. It's good to get the old brain of thinking. All right. Ready? Where do we start here? Okay, I can do either of those because I heard multiply by 5 and I heard add 4 fifth. Either one's going to get me to the same place. Um, since I heard the multiply, I will do the multiply. Now, no matter when you do the multiplying part, here's the kicker. You have to make sure that that 5 is taking care of both of these, that it's distributing through. But basically, it just cancels out the denominators on each of those. But again, I'm solving for y, so I've got to add the 4 over. I'm trying to isolate. And then what's my last step going to be? Divide by 2. And again, whether you leave it in one big fraction or you decide you want to write it as 5 halves x plus 2, either one's fine. The idea is just that we're getting that solved for y part of the situation. Okay? Any issues? What's that? 
this one. I add to the name. So whenever we're trying to find that inverse, again, just switch x and y, solve for y, just like we would with any equation we've done so far, and we're ready to go. Now, part two. Inverse is a function if the original passes the horizontal line test. Again, horizontal, side to side. So as I work my way up, which would the inverse of the function's graph below be a function? Remember, anywhere through your graph, you can run through, and if it only crosses at one point, it would be a function. Okay, so one point, yes, that's a function. When I draw a horizontal line through my graph, if it only crosses in one place, it's a function. If it crosses in more than one place, like one, two, three, four, I think I get messed across here, five. So that's a few more than one place. So this one, my inverse wouldn't be a function. What's that? It only can be a horizontal line for this particular test. <coughs> so if it crosses at one point, that's going to be a function. More than one point is not. And again, but it's horizontal. And it can be anywhere, but don't try to find an exception to the rule. That only crosses at one point. So that one inverse would be a function. Right, but remember, you're only doing it horizontally. If you're doing it vertically, I agree. You'd have an issue in some places. I totally agree with you. But in this case, since we're going horizontal, we only got the one have an issue with and we're good to go. Any issues on the front? That's it. They're, they keep waiting like there's got to be something. There's got to be more of a test for this. There has to be. Nope, not on that one. All right. Over we go. No, there's no catches. Okay, part three. The compositions f of g of x and g of f of x both given a result of x. Okay. This is where Hardy does something to get himself in trouble. So if any other teachers look at this video, I'm going to get yelled. That's okay. We're going to simplify this. If I did f of g of x and g of f of x in both of these, the answer comes out as x. But why do I want to do all that work? So there's a shorter way to do it. So, no, we're going to switch x and y. You're like, okay. You're going to solve for y. And you're like, I don't see a y. We'll discuss that in a minute. And what you're trying to do is see if your first function, when you solve for y, becomes the second one. If it does, they're inverses. So here's how this goes. Remember, f of x is a fancy way of saying y. So I'm only dealing with this right now, okay? First job, switch x and y. <laughs> what do I need to do next to solve for y? They add the 4. Last step, divide by 2. 1 half x plus 2 equals the inverse. Does this match what's over here? Yeah. Okay. So, yes. That would be the inverse. Okay. The other way you could do it is to plug this into the x here 
and see if you get X, and then you plug this into there and see if you get X. Who else do you want to know? Well, I shouldn't be saying this stuff, but you know, it's the truth. So that's how we test to see how these work. So I can do the same thing here. Again, f of x, fancy way of saying y. Switch them up. And then just go through and get y by itself. Do we match this time? No. Not the inverse. But that, that's kind of what we're up to here. And that works all the way through. And I'm doing all of these because this concept can be kind of true. Just keep telling yourself, f of x is a oopoo way of saying y. Yeah, I was going to say, it, it, it's going to get interesting here. So let's see. 5y plus 20. i got to get the 20 out of there. And you'll notice the way that most of the time the book or a worksheet will simplify is they're going to simplify it into both pieces of fraction. So just something to keep track of. Five, five, five. One fifth x minus four. Ding. Okay, that one works. And I'm hearing code is twelve. Let's find out. Okay, so there's y. So switch them. Minus the 5 on over. Yep, and I've got a cube root, this one. A cube root of x minus 5, and again, we have a winner. So again, keep it simple. Keep it, keep it, keep it, keep it simple. Any issues with figuring out if one function is the inverse of the other? Huh? Any questions on this part? No. Okay. On what we just did? Oh, the next, okay, yeah. Oh, we're moving on to the next part here, though. Find the inverse of the function. Why does this only work when x is greater than or equal to zero? Well, because, remember, what happens when you square any number? Well, so like, what if I had 3 squared to be 9, right? What if I had negative 3 quantity squared? It'd still be 9. So I'm not going to get any numbers that are going to quantify this negative. So when I do this, I change this to y, and I say, okay, this is the part I'm working with. Switch those. Now what? Square root it. So here's here's gonna be my deal. A couple of things. One, when I see this, we just got done talking about oops, we just got done talking about this in that last unit. This only works when x is greater than or equal to zero because that would be the restriction on a square root. If I get a negative, this isn't gonna work. So I have to be careful when they give me information like this to make sure I kind of use that as a clue saying, ooh, it means there's going to be a restriction on my domain when I get to this part. But that's all I have to do here. Okay? So don't let the fancy wordiness and x is greater than or equal to zero throw you off. You're just finding the inverse. You're switching x to y and you're solving for y. So kind of keep doing that. But, as was mentioned earlier, there's a couple of things that we do not have to worry about. Okay. 
All we did here was we took the expression, the f of x, which is y, equals x squared. I switched the x and the y, just like I've been doing on the rest of them. And then I'm solving for y. When they're asking me, why does this only work when x is greater than or equal to 0, if I tried to plug a negative number in here for x, in the calculator, I'm going to get an error message. Because I can't take the square root of a negative. We know we can pull an i out, they'll take care of it. But the calculator only works with real numbers. So that's why this little restriction they put on here might give us a hint as to what this is going to look like. But in reality, it's just the exact same thing we've been doing. Don't let it kind of throw you off at all. Okay? Same thing going forward. Continue to keep working on getting y by itself. And again, if you're breaking this up and calling it 1 half x minus 1 half, that's fine. But just like we had working before, I'm going to cube root this. And even though we're breaking a rule, we will survive. Yes, because I should be rationalizing the denominator. But it's one of those things that if I were going to graph this, which is the main time that you would use an inverse anyway, I could plug this into my calculator this way and I still could get a graph of it. Well, I was going to say, I think this might be, I'm trying to look at the other side here. Number four was the only other time we ran into this situation and we left it alone then too, on the front. Because if I had to try and rationalize this, I'd have to turn this into a perfect cube to be able to break it down and then I'm going to be doing a bunch of distributing up here. That's something more that you would have to deal with in an upper level type math class situation. There's other things that that would affect. For us right now, my main thing is when I get my expression, switch x and y, solve for y, and then just be done with it. Instead of having to take a bunch of extra steps. So that's absolutely good, fine, and acceptable for what we're doing here. Good questions. Good questions. Explanations like, oh no, he's going to start doing this more? A little bit. You don't like that. Explain how to use the horizontal line test to determine if an inverse relation is an inverse function. Okay. So, how do you pass the horizontal line test? Okay. So, it's the horizontal line. Passes only one point of the graph. The inverse is a function. You're just doing a quick word explanation of what the horizontal line test is. How would I use it? Well, if I draw a horizontal line, all it passes one point, the inverse is a function. That's it. Okay. Yeah, don't make it some big mathematical, you know, paragraph. Keep it simple. Keep same on 16. Describe how the graph of a relation and its inverse are related. And I'm going to show you this here, picture-wise here, in a moment. But what happens is the x and y values are reversed. So like when we had that chart before, when we had that chart on the front and we just switched the x's and y's, if I were to plot those points, and I'm actually going to physically do that here in a minute so you can see how this works. It, yeah, it's like a mirror image basically over this line y equals x, and I'm going to show you that. We'll get that up in just a second. But the last one on here, two steps. There's two steps to find an equation for an inverse. So like if you were trying to explain to me what I needed to do for number 9 or 10 or 11 or 12, 
What are the two steps I have to do? Switch x and y. Yep. Switch x and y. Solve for y. So let me take a moment here and show you how this inverse thing works with a graph. Because I know some of you, it clicks a little bit better when you can visually see how something works. So stick with me for a second. I know, you want to get jumped into the homework. I swear, this won't take longer than a minute. I'm going to flip this back over. Like we're going to time you once you start putting this on here. So, for instance, if I were to graph both of these, so I'm going to graph this one first. So I've got negative 2, 4. Negative 1, 2, 0, 1, negative 2, and 2, negative 4. Then I went and I plotted the other point. Now it always talks about when you reflect the original over the line y equals x. Okay, if y equals x, then, you know, 1, 1, <coughs> 2, 2. This y equals x line. It's kind of like my reflector line, or if you had a mirror in there, okay? If in geometry class you ever use a mirror, you can see the reflection of a line. So when I switch these, and I do, If you start to look at the lines, if I actually connect my dots here, what you're going to find out is, if I were to fold along this line, I would get the exact same things going on both sides. These points reflect each other or an, or an equal distance away from that reflection line. That's actually what an inverse function is. It's letting you see what the reflection of that line, kind of a mirror image of itself is. So if you were ever asked to graph them or ask about values, again, take your graph and just switch the values, okay? Switch them. If they gave you this picture and said, draw a picture of the inverse, just write down the point, Flip the x and y's and plot the points. Life is pretty good. So as usual, it's like wait, what? So here's what I'll do. I'll kind of put you down.